Hello, everyone. Welcome on behalf of Dallas College and the sustainability team. My name is Faye Davis, and I am also joined by my team members, Sonia Ford, um, Brandon Morton, and Lori Dela Cruz Lewis, and Neil Kaufman, um, who are all working in the background. Um, we are also grateful for, for the support of our Dallas College WebEx support team. Um, so without further ado, I have the honor of introducing our speaker today, Scott Blackburn. Scott Blackburn is an organic gardener and gardening educator based out of Austin, Texas. Scott has been sustainably growing food for 15 years, combining his many years in the nursery trade, passion for growing food, training as a digital storyteller, and incredible sense of humor. Scott uses social media to educate and motivate the world about sustainable food gardening. His TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube accounts have amassed tens of thousands of views. Scott is also the garden coordinator for UT Austin's UT Farm stand program. Thank you so much for joining us, Scott. Please take it away. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, you know, really hearing it like that uh, make, makes me really happy. So uh, I'm grateful to be with you today and uh, do this presentation. And when it comes to sustainability, I know there can be a variety of ways to come at it. And based on my experience and my practice, I thought we might try to go through this via the garden as an ecosystem, because I think it can be looked at metaphorically, but also there are some really practical applications um, from this perspective that I want to expand on. So I wanna start off with a discussion on sustainability and how it has related to my food growing journey. Um, like she said, you know, I've been growing food here in Austin for 15 years at the same property, really started as a novice, but very quickly found out that it was one of the most passionate things that I could be doing with my life. And I have, I have really stuck with it um, year over year, all year round. You know, luckily here in Central Texas, we can grow food for most of the year. So I grew up in Greensboro, North Carolina, and that was on a road called New Garden Road, which coincidentally is my social media handle. I really like the those three words together, New Garden Road, it just takes me on a journey in terms of what I really want to put out there for people uh, to understand the opportunities to make their own way and to find a way to garden that suits them. Uh, when I was growing up on New Garden Road, my dad had a pretty good garden space. And I would often wander out there and get curious about things. One day when I was about probably three or four years old, I remember standing on the front porch, looking up at the sky. And it's the first time I remember noticing an oncoming thunderstorm. And that really just kind of shifted my perspective. You know, I had that grounding, you know, granted I was pretty close to the ground at that point. So that's a lot of what I knew, but looking up, seeing this oncoming storm just being filled with wonder and kind of this almost mystic quality and from there i think going into the garden it just continued you know i was able to you know notice things work with my dad a little bit and uh funny story one day i was out there with my dad he let me harvest some okra with him and I was probably about four, four years old. So he gave me a knife and I started stabbing things as a young kid would do. Well, that was the day when I got my first gardening injury. And it's something that I'm really proud of because um, it has tied together for me 
over the course of my life, that experience at that place on New Garden Road that really planted a seed within me. I didn't always appreciate yard work and gardening when I was growing up. You know, my dad would ask me to help him with things and we were constantly digging up plants, dividing plants, gardening. But I can distinctly remember homegrown food being on the dinner table, fresh tomatoes, cucumbers, squash, things like that. And now that I have grown up and I've really looked back at that and gained so much appreciation for those experiences and being rooted in that environment, being exposed to those things. And that's the place where I'm coming from and everything that I'm out setting out to do as a gardening educator. Yeah, so it really came, came back around for me and I, I cherish those experiences. Now, fast forward to my journey more recently here in Austin, Texas. In 2006, I bought this property and it was wide open. There was a really wide open yard space. We got it in September. There were like five or six patches of dead sod and virtually no living things on the property and it's a third of an acre. So that really drew me in. I just knew something inside of me, that seed that was planted long ago started to germinate and I, I saw a place for me to grow. Since then, I have spent so many early mornings in the garden, observing, taking in the quiet time, watching the sun as it rises and observing insects, animals, the different stages of plants. And I, I would even go out there in the evening with a flashlight just to look under leaves and see what was out there at night because that's a really great way to explore what's going on in your garden because a lot of these things won't you won't see them during the day but when you go out there at night and use both hands have a flashlight you're going to find some really interesting stuff so i've been led by my own curiosity just wanting to learn more about what i see and then, you know, really training my eye to nature. You know, what, what are these things? I remember seeing this bug before, or this is a new bug. It, what, what stage of its life is it in? Is this, is this a disease starting on this plant? Why is this leaf curled? So over time, I've developed some sense of familiarity with these things that I've been observing over the years. And that's what's really built into me a basis of knowledge along with you know working in the nursery trade picking the brains of my co-workers and just learning as much as i could from every angle through reading um through through things on the web and also experiences participating in building gardens with other organizations it took a lot of trial and error um i'll tell you my my first garden i I barely scratched the surface, literally, in the soil, made a small mound, and grew some tomatoes. And this garden was in the shade, so things did not work out that great. But luckily, I have kept at it, and I have learned quite a lot along the way. So one of the things that I've taken with me is just understanding better the seasonal trends that we undergo, because I think this really underscores our ability to effectively manage the garden in whatever form or scale it is for the individual, how we can approach it in the most sustainable manner, because there, there's often a knee jerk reaction. You know, there's a bug in my garden. What do I do? What do I need to spray on it? There's ants in the garden. How do I get rid of them? Well, oftentimes it's something that will subside or change. And when you get a sense of the rhythm of nature, that can inform you in terms of your actions and how to proceed and whether or not you should do anything at all. One of the things that I, I think is a really good example of this is is the is when I talk about aphids and their 
their counterparts, the beneficial in insects that, you know, feed on them, such as hoverflies, lacewings, ladybugs. You know, we see aphids in the garden quite often, and it, it oftentimes seems like the worst thing. They are, they're ruining our crops. Initially, you know, I, I would follow suit and I would apply some insecticidal soap or I would spray them off with water just to try to get rid of them. But a lot of this information that I've observed from nature really kind of led me on this path where I, I began to understand that there are relationships there. And I saw, like I said, I saw things, I wondered what they were, I followed suit, I did research, I talked with other people. So hoverfly larvae would begin to appear and they were eating the aphids. Lace wings would appear and lace wing larvae are ferocious predators of aphids along with the ladybug larvae. So understanding these relationships, I got to a point where I said, I don't really feel right doing anything necessarily because there's something to this balance of nature. Do I need to use a pesticide or an organic product? Do I need to really put forth the energy to take care of this? How big is this issue? And also, what is the underlying cause of this happening? Is this just something that you're up against no matter what? Or is there more to it in terms of a root cause? So along with that perspective, I really have enjoyed developing practical systems that will help me to conserve resources. When I'm utilizing season extending techniques, you know, I, I did some research up front and understanding how to build a hoop house to go over a raised bed garden. And there were some different designs. They often required a lot of parts, but eventually I got to the place where I said, you know, how can I do this most sensibly? How can I, buy something that I can utilize without necessarily altering, that's as simple and expensive and resource savvy as possible. So that's what I did. I created systems along those lines that I've been able to reuse year over year that will help with season extension on my crops, helps me make the most of my effort. It, it also allows me to grow food deeper into the season. And it's just, I think it's a, a more sustainable way to approach gardening because in a lot of areas like central Texas, the weather is gonna change and the weather can be erratic. And if you're not prepared, you might have to start over or you might come up at a loss altogether. But at that point, you've wasted time and energy and resources. So it makes sense to look at this from that practical standpoint and understand how you can maximize your effectiveness and in, in utilizing these systems. And also I've, I found along the way, like I like pine straw for, for making mulch on my beds. Uh, these are pine needles. They usually come in a bale or something like that. What I figured out was this is not a one and done item just because I use the pine straw on my raised bed and then have the season ending. It doesn't mean I, I trash it or compost it. I'm going to gather it up and I'll reuse it season over season. It begins to break down slowly, but that's a resource that I'm trying to make the most of. And those are just the, the types of thoughts and approaches that I have really taken from my observation in the garden. I've also really enjoyed getting to the place where I've started to save seeds and sharing those seeds. There are some really wonderful organizations that you can get involved with. Uh, Central Texas Seed Savers is a good one. And I've, I've helped them, you know, package up seeds that people have donated so that we can redistribute for free to the community, people that need an opportunity to grow their own food and also to better preserve some of these these genetics that we might quickly lose. Um, along with that, I, I really got to know the crops that did the best in our region. Things like lima beans, southern peas, and warm season greens seem like they're virtually bulletproof through our Texas summers. They don't require a lot of water. They really stay green 
They act as a cover crop. They add nutrients to the soil, and they also produce food for us. These are also things that are fairly easy to save seeds from. And over the course of several years, you can develop a seed variety in your own garden that is better adapted to your specific microclimate. So you've got the toughest there is adapted to your specific location, and it does all those things. To me, that is the essence of a sustainable garden practice. Along with that, I really, you know, the more I gardened and grew my own food, I realized that I didn't like a lot of store-bought produce anymore. It just didn't taste the same. It didn't taste as good, it didn't look as good oftentimes, and I, I missed my homegrown lettuce, my collard greens, my kale, all those things. Well, what happens when we get into the warm season here is you can't necessarily grow some of those crops in, in that weather. However, if you expand your, your outlook and try to consider what else can you grow, with some modifications, some adaptation, you'll find that there are some warm season greens out there. Um, things like New Zealand spinach, Malabar spinach, a Ganura, which is a long longevity spinach. There are a myriad of these and they, like I said, they're gonna take some adaptation because they don't taste like fresh crisp lettuce. However, uh, they're nutrient dense. You can grow them pretty easily. And I think that is a great way to expand your, your outlook on growing food or even the available foods in your region because, you know, it, it's nice to be able to go to the store year round and purchase a, a plastic box of, of fresh greens, but it does come at a cost. So it's just a perspective that I've built over the years and it has really propelled me to experiment. Um, yeah, so kind of wrapping this section up, essentially I have found through my origin story that I am innately passionate about true organics. I'm not talking about a certification or a label. You know, the same would apply to sustainability. You know, these often become buzzwords for us, but you know, what, what does that really mean? What does it look like? You know, how did we garden before the industrial revolution when we were few and far between and we didn't have garden centers? That was probably as organic as it got. So kind of understanding that that is possible, it has led me to have that as a core principle. And from that, I have set out to develop a regenerative approach to the practice of gardening. Having an ecological perspective is something that has really blossomed in my mind recently. Uh, I listened to a podcast from Joe Gardner and he was interviewing, I believe it was the horticultural director of the Brooklyn Bridge Park. And, you know, she said some things that just blew my mind, but they also resonated with me deep down. She talked about, you know, where some of the bumblebees overwinter and grasses and the fact that you know, in traditional English English style gardening, we cut things back seasonally to clean it up and keep it looking good. However, this comes at the cost of disturbing our native species and a lot of the, the insects and animals that we rely upon to make our gardens healthy and happy. So, you know, it's it's like it goes like this. Are weeds a bad thing? Well, um, it depends on your perspective. If they serve a purpose, then maybe there's something to open up to there. Also, they can be medic medicinal, edible, and I think this is just really fascinating to think about that. There's oftentimes there's not space in a, a manicured lawn for things like that. However, taking a lesson from Brooklyn Bridge Park, you know, they, they've really made their entrance in different locations nice and tidy and really pretty and formal but they have these pockets throughout this 85 acre park, which are more wildscapes. The weeds are allowed to stay 
and that allows the ecosystem to flourish in a more balanced manner. So understanding that perspective, having some give and take, and considering a different way to approach our gardens. I've really gotten into hosting the pipevine swallowtail butterfly in my garden. It's it's a mostly black butterfly, but it's got a, a nice blue pattern near the base. They have the most remarkable caterpillars. They're they're mostly black with some red rings. And I a while back I got some seeds for the Dutchman's pipe vine, and I planted that in my garden for three or four years, nothing happened. And then one spring, I noticed some of the caterpillars and I got really excited. The next year, I don't think much happened, but last year I had three generations of these caterpillars hosting on my, my Dutchman's pipe vine. So much so that I really need to plant as much as possible because you know, there, there's like 50 to 100 caterpillars that just chow down on this stuff. But then, you know, it gets me to the stage where I'm like, where are they pupating? I don't want to disturb them. I need to understand that there's maybe some protected areas in my garden that I should leave be. So it's just increased my awareness through that combination of observation and exposure to some different perspectives. So do, do I treat for aphids or not? I mean, it, it, it kind of going back to that that dynamic between the beneficial predatory insects and aphids, if I don't have the aphids, I might not have the beneficial predatory insects. So that that is a part of building the garden ecosystem. And it's it takes some perspective as well as just being okay with having some of these in your garden. Not everything is bright and shiny and perfect, but if you're you're building a garden ecosystem, you're gonna get rewards far beyond uh, your imagination because you're gonna find new things. Butterflies are gonna come and you, you just, when you see one of those take off for the first time and it's been raised in your garden, it's an amazing feeling. So we're not only growing food, but we're fostering an ecosystem. I, truly hope that this is the future of urban gardening. I, we need to continue to shift our, our efforts, our commercial products, our training and education, and we really need to get closer and understand better nature's playbook. Because when you observe nature, you, you really start to understand these different levels. And even if you don't get it 100% clearly, there's something inside of you maybe that it, it resonates with and you, you think there's something here I, I that will unfold over time you will you'll get exposure to a new idea have a conversation see something and if you're open to it i think that can really really get us there uh so what what does this look like because uh you know I, i've come into this this subject here uh the soil food web now there's quite a lot to this graphic. And I'm, I'm certainly not going to break it down. I'm far from an expert on the soil food web, but it really makes sense to me. The more I look at it, the more I listen to people talk about it, the more I read, um, it really illustrates what the garden as an ecosystem looks like. The plants are essentially the ones that are in control. Uh, when you look at a mature forest, you know, everything's, if it's untouched and it's allowed to, it's, it's in perfect balance. There's harmony. Uh, and they're not, they're not monoculture environments, right? You have all an array of plants working in a symphony together and what you might consider a weed in an urban garden is not a weed in a mature forest. It has its place. And this is all part of setting the stage for plants to be able to thrive within the higher trophic levels of these organisms that only reside when there's that balance and those things are allowed to persist. Yeah, so that's, that's quite a contrast to the urban garden, um, but I think it's, 
it's certainly something to think about and consider and study and just begin to realize that there is a really big complexity to this that we might not have thought of before. We go to the garden center or the big box retailer and we, we get our items and we come home and we plant our plants and we think, okay, we're done, you know, and that you can grow food like that. You can grow plants like that. And that's a great, um, great way to get into it. But I would encourage um, individuals to, you know, follow their passion, realize, you know, what they, you know, what level they want to get into it, but also understand that this has an effect on how we can be more sustainable in our approach to gardening. Yeah, so I have a, you know, my question is, how do humans play a role in this? Because um, there's this quote here that I, I really liked that went along with that graphic, life in the soil, life above the soil, and throughout the trophic levels of organisms is the basis of energy captured by the sun and moved to our foods, environment, and us. So all of that comes back around to us. We're a part of it. You know, we, we didn't establish the mature forest, but we can be um, stewards of it. We can be stewards of our urban garden. And that's something that we can strive for as we educate ourselves, share with one another, and move forward in whatever level or scale is appropriate to us. You know, you can do that indoors when you're growing uh, some sprouts or on the balcony, you can just consider these things and that can kind of feed your curiosity as well as just shift our mindset on the, the larger, larger scale. So I know that's a lot to process. It's uh, something that I think about quite a lot. I just find it really fascinating. It's, it's, encouraging me to alter my approach to gardening, which I welcome. And the thing that I would say about it is I'm working towards more closed loop systems, okay? Having worked at a retail plant nursery for 13 years, I had access to top quality organic products. And I feel like I had established somewhat of a gratuitous garden. You know, this is not something that everyone can create, you know, depending on your location, where you are in the world, you might not be able to grow a garden quite like this if you don't have those products, but there's a different way to do it, a different way to look at it and systems that you can develop that are based on a more of a closed loop. Uh, so the benefits of composting at home versus commercial compost, I think are really fascinating. When you look at something you produce at home, you're, you're capturing indigenous microorganisms that are adapted to your microclimate. And I think that's a big advantage, particularly when you look at a climate like Central Texas, where things can be pretty tricky from season to season. So it's not to say that diversity won't benefit you, but it's something to consider, as well as if you're creating your own compost, that's that's a systematic approach that you don't have to, you know, spend any money on something in a plastic bag that's used gas to get to you and coming from California or whatever. You know, I'm, I don't want to, you know, not knocking these things, just kind of highlighting the contrast. So along with that, experimenting with natural farming techniques, using plants to build soil and feed biology. It goes back to that soil food web loop. You know, we, we might not have it in our urban garden or in even some of the large scale ap agricultural applications, but it's something that we can work towards establishing that really, really makes sense in terms of sustainability. I've been experimenting with collecting indigenous microorganisms you should look into this, Korean natural farming or just natural farming. There's really a lot to it. I think it's just kind of like the soil food web. It's it's a rabbit hole to go down and it can expose you to really great ways of doing this, but creating all the inputs uh, that you have 
to use in your garden from your garden. That's that's the place that I am really wanting to move to. Um, yeah, adding biology to the soil, feeding and stimulating soil biology. That's that's you know going to be the essence of transforming uh, some of these spaces to in, to better alignment with the soil food web. Learn to treat the soil as a living thing and a precious resource. This is something that I feel it in my bones. It's, you know, we focus on the plant growing the tomato. It's beautiful. It's delicious. It's like the trophy of summer, but we've got to understand that doesn't happen without good soil. And how much better can we make the soil? How, how can we treat it? You know, there, there are different ideas out there around no till and the no dig methods. When you look at that soil food web graphic, you understand that there are all these things at play, the fungi, the bacteria that can potentially be disturbed, not to mention the soil structure. So if we overdo it on the tilling and the digging, we're disrupting those things that really help us to be successful. I'm also a big proponent of utilizing cover crops and mulch to protect soil life. I don't wanna have a bare soil um, you know, I'm either going to cover it with mulch or grow a cover crop even better. And that is going to keep that cycle of life going or is going to form a barrier there to all that life that I've established to, you know, get through to the next crop. So contrast this for a moment. Let's, let's look behind the veil. Grocery stores and cultural expectations. Um, you know, we need these large agricultural systems to feed our people. It's it's just something that's that we need. But having blueberries year round, it's it's something that gets stuck in my head. Is this really reasonable? I think it's, you know, particularly here in Central Texas, very hard to grow blueberries. Our soil doesn't like it. So it's an uphill battle. Just think about that on a larger scale. And then we have them in the grocery store virtually every day of the year. Um, you know, better option might be blackberries. They're seasonal, but they, they're thorny, but they grow like crazy here in Texas. They love it. And, you know, that, that can be a really nutritious food. But it's just something I've become to understand that food crops are seasonal, and yet we have this year-round access to fresh foods. It's, it's something not to be taken for granted, and I think there's perspective in it. Obtaining foods from all over the world requires complex systems and vast resources. And I, I definitely think there are opportunities where we can make gains and a positive impact, because I, you know, I don't want this to be all gloom and doom, just kind of food for thought. Seeking out regional and seasonal foods conserves resources, it reduces waste, it promotes sustainability and food system diversity while building community. That all sounds really good to me. Supporting local farmers, markets, and artisans, having access to more nutritious food that, you know, the food is gonna retain more nutrition, it's traveling less, if it's grown organically and sustainably, it will be of high nutritional value. And, you know, this is another thing that I think about. These fruits and vegetables in the grocery store, you know, it's granted they, they need to be clean and they go through a lot of hands and travel a lot of miles. They, there's some sterilization going on there. If you compare that with the homegrown food that we, we can enjoy or even, you know, locally produced uh, produce, there, there's a microbiome there that's present and more viable within our region, when the, within the season, that will add to our own microbiology. Our, our gut health is not something that comes from nowhere. It comes from the things that we come in contact and the foods that we eat. So a lot of times you're not getting that from the fruits and vegetables at the grocery store. Uh, you know, my mission as a gardening educator is to promote gardening literacy. 
And I think that's important for several reasons. Um, you know, being a gardening educator rooted in sustainable practices, building an ecological perspective of food systems, you know, it's not always cheap and easy. And I, I think that's kind of like the hook on a lot of tutorials or videos or articles out there. And that can be good in terms of drawing people in, um, but it's just not always the case. It can be really challenging and sometimes you, you have to spend some money, but then you have to understand that you have the option of starting small, lower your expectations, get your hands dirty in a little something, see what comes of it, see how much you love it and enjoy it. Are you afraid of bugs? Are you, you know, not want to be out in the heat? Um, do you not want to go out in winter and freezing temperatures and cover up your plants every time there's a, a freeze? You know, these are things to consider, um, but it takes a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in my my assessment. And I think having that perspective and understanding what farmers uh, and larger agricultural systems really go through is very informative. But overall, I want to encourage success, persistence, and instilling these values. I want to uplift people. You know, one thing I say a lot is I want to inspire, inform, and elevate you. And that's that's true. I want to share knowledge. I want to inspire people to try new things, and I want to lift them up because if they fail and they give up, that's not good. We all need to keep going and give it a shot because that's the best way for us to learn. I think this is really a path for building a community of optimists that provides an opportunity to make a positive impact by contributing to biodiversity and habitat restoration. And my garden, you know, granted it's a fairly large garden, consider, considering um, it's a drop in the bucket, but I know I'm fostering wildlife, I'm creating habitat, and I am welcoming biodiversity. I am learning, I am enriching, enriching my heart, my mind, my body with nutritious food, and it is, it has inspired me creatively to move forward, to spread this message and share it with others and try to be a resource so that we can approach it more, more comfortably. So that's my presentation on the garden as an ecosystem. And it's not only the garden that's an ecosystem, but it's, you know, it's the whole planet. It's the, the way we look at things, our approach to sustainability. And I think, you know, for me personally, I've taken a lot of lessons from my time in the garden, my experiences. And I, I just think that it holds a lot of valuable information in counterbalancing some of the issues that we're facing. Thank you so much, Scott. That was extremely inspiring and informative. And um, we do have a few questions. Um, so uh, if you don't mind, we, maybe you can take some questions from the audience in the last few minutes. Okay. Um, so the first question I see here is, oh, a uh, good one. Let's start with the big one. So has climate change had an impact on your gardens? If, and if so, have you, how have you adapted to it? 100% it has had an impact on my garden. The, the seasons, you know, gardening year round for 15 years, I have seen the seasons, like I said, recognizing those patterns, those trends, those have changed a little bit. Over the last five years, it's been more frequent with the erratic nature of the winter and the summer weather. I feel like in Central Texas, it can be all seasons in one week, but it, it really, I think, inspires me to put forth that message of how soil is important, what a precious resource it is, and then developing systems that can help us to extend the season that we truly want to grow some food and not be disappointed and give up, you know, we have to put forth the effort and instill some of these other elements. You know, I didn't talk about rainwater harvesting, but I think that's something that, you know, first of all, it needs to rain, but 
it's it's definitely something that we should in, be investing in big time because um, that's something that we need to grow food. Um, so without a doubt, it it has affected my garden, and I, I just have seen it uh, year over year. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, so uh, Ashley says, I've had problems with grub worms and I always use uh, nematodes. Should I take a step back from that? Or uh, I am under the assumption um, that grub, grub worms are always destructive. Mm, that's a great question. So I think it's possible that, that grub worms are destructive. Um, do they cause problems? Yes. But do they cause problems at the level that we often see in these discussions? I, I don't know. I'm sometimes I'm skeptical about it. I think if you're looking at the lawn or garden space and you take a square foot and you dig around in there under the soil, if you don't see eight to ten grub worms in that square foot, then I don't think that's an excessive number. Um, uh, a lot of times, you know, when it gets to that level. You know, things like the beneficial nematodes can help. Also, you know, outdoor lights can attract those beetles and oftentimes you'll get a, 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 a cluster of grub worms in a space with, that has outdoor lighting. So that could be something to follow suit on. But, you know, again, they're, they're part of the ecosystem. So I think you have to balance that with what are they actually doing something? And according to you know your specific findings, you know there are things that you can do in terms of the nematodes, increasing your soil's biology so that you have more of a balance there in terms of predatory insects and things of that nature that can flourish and help to balance things out. Thank you. Um, next question is, how do you feel about utilizing UV lighting? Okay, so is that in the context of indoor growing, uh, I'm assuming? Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not real sure about that one. Um, I, I would kind of need some more context on where that uh, question's coming from. They, they, there's a myriad of, uh, of gardening methods and approaches and you know, I really think in the big pie that is gardening, you know, what I do is a small slice. So it just could be something that I haven't gotten to yet. No problem. And um, maybe uh, they can uh, message with a follow up. Um, so next, we'll just move on to the next question. Um, so uh, Brandon wants to know, does organic gardening really attract more bugs? Do some of your vegetables get donated to the ecosystem? Does organic gardening attract more bugs? Well, I think I would argue that organic gardening makes room for more bugs because, you know, in pointing to that soil food web graphic, you know, those all are things that we need. You know, I talked about the aphids, which we, you know, hands up, let's stop it right now. Um, but understanding the relationships as well as the root cause you know, why are plants stressed? Are they not getting enough sun? Do they have poor soil? These can cause plants to emit stress hormones. And then the cycle of nature, you know, it's like the lion hunting the weaker prey, the smaller prey. That's the easy, easy one to get. So these insects come along to do their job to break down some of these plants that are not doing so well. It's easy for them to take advantage of. When you set the stage, from an organic sustainable approach and promote healthy soil, then you're going to really have plants that are more impervious to plant to pests and disease. Thank you. You got hand claps for that one. I don't know if you saw that. <laughs> um, but we've got time for a few more questions. Um, so next is um, Neil wants to know how we can follow you on social media, which I have seen um, a lot of your TikTok videos, by the way, they are fantastic. Um, so yeah, please, yeah, uh, how can, how, what, what channels are you on and how can we follow you? 
I was kind of holding back on this one. I always kind of want to measure appropriateness. And I also, you know, I'm mission driven. I'm not out for fame and fortune. I hope I can continue to do this and offer value, but I, I'm definitely on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, uh, at New Garden Road. Um, and then I have a website, newgardenroad.com. I really try my best to answer every single question and respond to uh, every communication that comes my way. And as of now, I'm at the level where I can do that. It definitely keeps me busy, but as well as providing value, I think it helps me learn. Uh, so I love that. Thank you. And uh, so let's squeeze in uh, one or two more questions. So um, Meg wants to know, do marigolds keep the bugs out of the garden? Are there other plants that might keep bugs from eating your veggies? I think marigolds are a good variety and can contribute to that type of balance and their, their natural uh, chemical uh, makeup, but you might not expect it to be a miracle. You know, if you if you've got an abundance of marigolds, that might make a more pronounced uh, effect. But overall, I think growing diversity, you know, biodiversity to me is about you know insects, birds, reptiles, all those levels of living things, but also plants. You know, plants with bloom sizes that are are different because you have a variety of insects of different sizes, and some of them need a big landing pad, some of them need a small one, and when you cultivate a diverse array of flowering plants along with marigolds and some of the some of the other things that are said to repel like mosquitoes like lemongrass and geraniums i think you're going to be taking more of a an effective approach than maybe one plant in a pot next to the garden thank you and um if uh, if anybody has any other questions, please feel free to keep putting them in the chat. If we can't get to them, um, I'll, uh, Scott will get them and we can uh, email you the answer. Um, but let's, uh, I see one more. So um, what about the use of fertilizers when growing veggies, um, like cow manure, other resources and fire ants? How can you get rid of them organically? Okay, I wanna take a stab at fire ants first because this is, timely and I see it a lot. Fire ants are, you know, they represent physical danger. You know, you, you can get injured from them, they're painful, um, but taking a step back, they're a part of the ecosystem. And I think the context is understanding that when you see a fire ant mound in your garden, that's the tip of the iceberg. There can be a vast network under your lawn space, your, your garden area, where those fire ants are present. So for me personally, you know, I have fire ants throughout the garden. I understand that they migrate. When we get a heavy deep soaking of rain, they'll start to pop up because they've been flooded out, but they will eventually move on. You can also encourage that by you know, something local, like a, a drench of really hot, hot water poured slowly over the mounds, um, that will oftentimes encourage them to move on. Molasses is said to have some benefits in that, that order. But overall, I, I, I really tend to just look out for them, be aware of them. And, you know, I have, I really have, rarely have issues with them. And, uh, you know, in terms of fertilizers and manure compost in the garden, you know, that's, that's something that I've built my garden on. You know, I, like I said, I'm investigating, moving forward towards more of a closed loop, understanding how to create my own inputs. But I think you have to build healthy soil. And part of that is adding biology. And so you're doing that with compost. And when it's a manure based compost, you be, you really need to be aware. Okay. Um, are there any herbicides present in the food? What is the food that the cattle are eating? How is it processed at the commercial, you know, site? Is it really composted and broken down? So I always encourage buyer beware, you know, smell it. It sh should smell like earth. And, you know, if you're, if you're unsure, you know, you can kind of do a test. Lagoons are a really good indicator of, you know, pesticides or herbicides. Um, but I, you know, I've long said, feed those veggies so they'll feed you. Um, and, and I think if you've got a healthy 
mechanism there and the soil food web is given an opportunity to develop, that can do a lot to sustain itself. That's the most sustainable model. However, if you are you know, growing in the garden, an urban garden, you want to supplement that. Uh, you know, I really like organic compost, I mean, organic fertilizers from Sustain, as well as uh, fish emulsion. Uh, I'll use I'll use those uh, to to feed the plants. But ultimately, I'm looking at feeding the soil because that is where the roots of the plants are. It's the stomach of the plant, and that is where all the action happens for the plant to grow. Thank you, um, and I would love to squeeze in this last one. Thank you um, to the person that asked this, but uh, can you briefly talk about um, the UT Farm Stand program at UT Austin? We could potentially have some transfer students interested in getting involved. So yes, please tell us what you do. So the, the, the UT Farm Stand is a student-run organization and it's designed to model, you know, uh, sustainable food growing systems, um, market systems, and a zero waste uh, approach. So being able to exemplify those to the UT community, help to educate the student body and how those elements come together and be able to you know, go forward into the world uh, with that knowledge. My role there has been as an educator, uh, a coordinator in terms of planting the right things at the right time, understanding how to take the soil from dirt to a living thing, um, and all those myriad of methods to organic sustainable applications in the garden setting. But there's just, there's really been so much uh, in this position that has inspired me. Um, taking the perspective from the students involved, the volunteers, seeing them make some progression, be inspired, you know, plant some seeds. You know, that, that's the thing that I want to do by and large in my mission. And my work with the UT Farm Stand has really given me a great opportunity to understand how I can do that uh, as more effectively, more, more broadly. And uh, I'm just, I've been really grateful for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, and I'm loving all of the puns, by the way. Please keep going with them. <laughs> <All right. laughs> they are delightful. Um, so that is all the time we have today. Thank you, Scott. Thank you to the audience for joining.